even if it is in the smallest of degrees, I want to move forward and I want us to move forward. This is how we grow, by aiming for things that are higher than us. So we're going to continue this series called The Highest Standard. And the highest standard is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, His Son, as God predestined us, as He says in Romans. Now, we've kind of gone through this series, and it's kind of been a preparation. Um, we said that the Orthodox growth and spirituality, the first stage is purification, which is getting rid of the bad. You can't just acquire the good and be like Christ, and yet we have all these sins. So we started off talking about repentance. And we talked about repentance for even the small sins. And then we talked about humility, without which you could never acquire anything in your spiritual life. And then we spoke about obedience. And then we had Holy Week. Um, we're going to continue now with some of the more positive qualities of Christ's character. These are the things that we love most about Him. And the second stage of Orthodox spirituality growth Purification is getting rid of the sins. Sanctification is the acquiring of the virtues. Now I want everyone to understand, um, being like Christ is not merely just a matter of the will. You can't just decide to do it. And you can't just come up with a plan kind of like we're doing. And I... Don't expect anyone in the last six weeks to have achieved what we're talking about. Just by hearing them or talking about, in, talking about them or reading them doesn't make you all sudden like Christ. And I feel like many of us have tried aspects of being like Christ that we've talked about and maybe have felt disappointed. You know what? I expect that. It's important to know that this is the process. Of becoming like Christ and you won't acquire a different virtue every week you just need to know what is necessary for us to become more Christ like and then we have to work on it so don't be disappointed if you haven't become completely like Christ yet the most important part of our spiritual lives is the grace we receive from God and the Holy Spirit and I don't know, we, we haven't really touched on that much. We've kind of talked about the things that we do. But I want to emphasize, we cannot do anything on our own. Our participation, our struggles are extremely important and necessary. We won't get anything by just saying, God give me grace and let me be changed. Our struggle is necessary, but it is impossible for a human to just become like God without the help of God. That should make sense, right? The finite human will never become like the infinite God without the help of God. And that's why this is so overwhelming. So what we talk about in the Orthodox Church is a synergistic relationship. And if you go back to your vocabulary when you were in elementary school, synergy is when the outcome of two things together, together is greater than the sum of its parts. So when you work with God, you can achieve much more than just two people coming together. It'll be more than what you have expected. And so we need more than anything, if you want to become like Christ, which is what God has commanded us to do, is that you have to seek God's grace and the Holy Spirit. I want you to realize, don't expect anything to happen without God's grace. That means, unless our spiritual lives are focused on being united with Him, then what we're doing is kind of like a behavior modification process. And that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is not just changing behaviors, but changing who we are. We're looking for our whole person to be different. I've heard of people call some holy people, they say they were like angels from heaven living among us. That's a process where someone becomes like an angel. Or they said this person was the living gospel. That's not just a decision. I'm going to now live and be the living gospel. It requires a union with Christ in order for you to become that. This whole idea of changing ourselves. This is what theosis is. So theosis, this concept, 
of becoming like God, we don't become God in His essence or in His nature. What we do is we participate in the energies of God. His love, His forgiveness, His salvation, His mercy. So, in order to do this, like I said, we need God's grace. How do we get God's grace? How do we get God's grace? <coughs> Saint Seraphim uh, of Sarov wrote um, an article on the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing. And he says the most important things you can do to receive the grace of God are prayer and living the life of the church and humility. You will not receive the grace of God without humility and prayer and participating in the life of the church. Those three are key. If you make no efforts in these, then you can just forget about it. Don't expect to be like Christ. Now, I'm not saying you can't do good deeds. And, and prayer and humility and life of the church may not seem as exciting to you as, well, I want to give my life for the whole world. I want to lay my life down for my friends. That's nice. Those are doing good deeds, but your character is not going to change without the help of God. You know, even non-Christians, they can do good deeds. Um, we're looking not only for positive behavior, but a change of character and a change of mind. We want to become holy, just like He's holy. So what is going to be required is that we spend time with Him to become like Him. I mean, that should be like an automatic, I haven't spoken about that as much, but don't expect to become like Christ if you never spend time with Him. And that's the most important thing, and I think a lot of us forget that. And, and I've kind of focused on the things that we do, but I really want you to realize that you need to have a relationship with God, and you need to receive His grace. So, in order for us to become like Christ, now I'm going to talk about the things that we can do in addition to concentrating our spiritual lives on Him. You would want to study that person. You want to become like Christ, you have to study Him. You have to study the things that He did and the things that He said. And I believe the New Testament, which is the goal of this year, Hopefully, we take a little break, but hopefully you guys are trying to continue. Our goal for 2015 at Holy Transfiguration Church, remember we had that 2015 commitment? One of them was to read the New Testament in one year. How many chapters is it? About 280 chapters. So we've gone through about 120 days, so there's about 240 days left in the year, and there's 280 chapters. So if you haven't read a single chapter in the New Testament... Throughout 2015, if you started today, one chapter, one and a half chapters, one and a quarter chapters, you'd still reach your goal. But we need to study Christ in order to become like Him. This is how we're going to learn His heart. Now, the greatest teachings of Christ come in the Sermon on the Mount. When you read it, you'll see that Christ was coming to set a higher standard. If you, if you really pay close attention, he was kind of like being revolutionary in what he was teaching them. He said many of the things that were in the law were kind of like an eye for an eye. You know, if you were to steal from someone, then you would do this. And if you want to know the problem with an eye for an eye, the whole world becomes blind. So what we want to do is what he wants us to do is go beyond the requirements. In the Old Testament, you know, they would have these laws, and the Pharisees and the scribes would kind of find out what the minimum was. And here he's saying, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. He doesn't want you to do just the bare minimum to get by. He wants you to go above and beyond. And I believe that's what sets Christianity apart in so many ways. There are great people out there like Gandhi, and even Gandhi, what did he say about the gospel in the New Testament? He says, I love your Jesus, and I love the gospels, but it's like a crown of jewels, and the greatest jewel is the Sermon on the Mount. Even people from outside say there's something special about these teachings that teach you to go above and beyond. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a passage, and I'm going to kind of tell you what I want to focus on for now. This is in Matthew 5, you know the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Some of the best verses to me are in Matthew 5, 38 to the end. 
So if you want to follow in your Bibles, here's what it says. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So if you do all this, you will be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Again, he's calling us to be like God, holy, not limited, but going above and beyond. This is quite the high standard. Now, what I wanted to focus on this godlike standard is just one of these verses which um, kind of ties in the others. And it's the line that says, if someone asks you to go with him one mile, go with him too. I think some of you have heard this before. I don't know if everyone knows what it refers to. So back in that day, the Roman soldiers, the Roman Empire was in charge. And by law, they could tell a Jewish person, usually a young Jewish boy, to carry their bag for one mile, and then they could go back. So Jews hated this. They, they would be in their properties and their farms doing whatever their work, and they would mark exactly one mile from their property so they didn't go one foot further. They would take that bag and just, I'm done, and go back. Now, if I had to do this, or if you had to do this, now remember the Romans were not like buddy buddies, right? These are people that did it to mock you. They did it to keep you down and say, come, take my bag for a mile. What would be the thoughts in your mind? Don't say them out loud because we're in church. But that's how I would feel. I would be cursing them left and right, wishing that everything could fall on them or that this backpack would somehow like, you know, that's how we'd feel. And Christ says, I don't want you to do that. What I want you to do is go See, like if you walk one mile out, you know how far it is back? It's another mile. So if you were to go an extra mile, that's a four mile walk. Now I know we like to walk, but it's just not the same. It's not just a pleasureful walk. So why would Christ tell someone to do that? Because the first mile is required. The first mile is out of obedience, but the second mile is out of love. It's out of genuine kindness towards an enemy, someone that you ordinarily would not like. The second mile is something that is, is crazy to many people. It takes us from the minimum to more. A lot of people say, well, God said give a tithe, which is 10%, so I'm going to give, I'm going to calculate it exactly, 10%, God gets this, I've done my job. And yet as Christians, He didn't say give 10%. And He didn't limit us. He said, I want you to go above and beyond. And if you think about it, that's kind of what it is with your family. You know, those whom you love, you don't do just the minimum requirements. I mean, you could feed them oatmeal every day, and they would probably survive. But hopefully, you take at least one day a week a break from oatmeal, and you give them something more because you love them. You go a little bit extra, right? You want to do something else. This is kind of how our Christianity is. Our life goes from obedience and the fear of God... And then when you get to a certain intimacy with God, what did St. John say? 
perfect love casts out fear. You find yourself going the extra mile willingly, voluntarily. And Father Bashoy Kamel wrote a book about this, The Second Mile, and it's, it's pretty amazing. And I'm supposed to have that paper that I wrote down some of the notes on in my pockets. And I can't find them. I have a Rice Krispie Treat wrapper. So, um, but he was saying how it's amazing that this voluntary act of the second mile, it transforms you because now it gives you power over the other person. Now they're not making you, now it's of you, like you're in control. It's the second mile that actually transforms you, but it actually also transforms the other. Um, we can totally see this in our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this is what he did. I'm not gonna talk about the second mile going from heaven to earth, because it was probably a little bit more than two miles. That was, the incarnation was incredible. I'm not going to talk just about that. What about not just healing someone, but forgiving them? What about not saying hello to Zacchaeus, but going to the evil tax collector's house? The Samaritan woman was totally out of his way in the middle of the day. I mean, it was not comfortable. It was a hard thing to do, and yet it was... The second mile, he made it his goal to go beyond the norm. Do I need to talk about the washing of the feet of the disciples, which we talked about on the Holy Thursday evening? Need I say much about going to the cross willingly? He didn't just die on the cross, but while he was there on the cross, hanging in agony, he said, Father, forgive them, and he made excuses for them because they don't know what they're doing. He's dying. He could have just died and said, I'm done. But in the end, he made it one step more. This was his teaching. That was his way. And that's what he wants our way to be. His followers did the same thing. I'm going to read to you from Ephesians chapter 4 and see how this is exactly the second mile. Therefore, putting away lying, let each of one of you speak truth with his neighbor. So he's saying, don't just stop lying. Now I want you to speak truth. He says, we're members of one another. He says, be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath. He says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he might have something to give who was in need. Usually people who steal are in need. They're getting for themselves. He says, I don't want you to just stop stealing. Now I want you to get a job. Now I want you to have abundance, so now you could then go and give to those who are in need. He says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But he doesn't say just don't say bad things. He says, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. You see, this is all throughout the gospel. It's not meant to just cut out the bad. It's not meant for us to do the minimum. It's for us to go above and beyond. I'm going to tell you a few stories of people who did this that are pretty amazing. There's a story of St. Macarius, who uh, you know was a monk in the 4th century. And uh, there was a lady that used to come and visit the monastery or whatever. Well, she had a baby out of wedlock. She blamed it on St. Macarius. So St. Macarios, the monk, this holy person, was accused. And so the other monk said, you have to go and support this lady and her baby. This is your fault. You are responsible. So he went. He left the monastery and he went. And he did work with his own hands for months, months, until it was time to give birth. And... You know, the baby was not coming out. She was in agony. She kept hiding this, collecting the money for her baby from St. Macarius, who was working hard, and the baby would not come out. She struggled and struggled. Her labor was so difficult. Finally, she confessed that it wasn't St. Macarius' fault. It was someone else, and that she had committed a sin with someone else. And the whole town was like, oh my gosh, let's go and tell St. Macarius. And he left before they could come and tell him. 
an angel came and told him, you have truly become like God. Like he didn't say, you know what, she did a sin. Here I am, I'm innocent, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to accuse her, and I'm going to tell her, he says, no, listen, she made a sin, I'm going to go over, and I'm going to go support her. Like, that's incredible. And the voice that he heard, you have become like, you've become like God. I have two saints that I really love, Abu Machi Ibrahim and Abu Bishwai Kamal. Uh, Abu Machi Ibrahim, uh, he passed away in the 70s, as did Abu Bishwai Kamal. And Abu Machi Ibrahim was an incredible person, and I don't know all the stories anymore, but one of them just kills me. So, in Egypt, they have a makwagi, you know, like a place where they go, it's like a dry cleaner. They go and they dry, clean your clothes, and they iron it for you. So he went and took his clothes, and then when he came back to the store, this, the owner was so sad, he's like, I'm so sorry, but our store caught on fire. And so much of the clothes were ruined. And so Abu Nabil, before he was a priest, he, he asked him one question. Was it ironed before it was burned? And that's the question you would have asked, right? <laughs> and he says, yeah, it was. So then he took out his wallet and he paid him for the work that he had done. I could not believe that. He didn't say, okay, you know what? This is how much the pants cost me. You could be married. like, oh, just forget about it. But then to go an extra mile and then to take money out of your pocket to help the person in need, even though he had lost something. It was his right. He let go of his right, and yet he helped someone in need. Abu Machi Ibrahim, one time, they had guests at the church. This when he was at a priest. And... Um, he brought guests and they didn't have enough room to stay in their house, so he had them stay at the church. And they, So he took them to the church, they stayed and slept in the church on the floor, and then the wife wakes up the next morning and she cannot find him in the room, whatever. And then she sees him on the floor, on the ground, you know, in their apartment. She starts screaming, Abuna, Abuna! You know, she thought he'd die. And he's like, what are you screaming for? Why are you waking me up? She says, why are you laying on the floor? She says, well, how could I let the brothers of Christ sleep on the floor and me sleep on a bed? Wow. Like, he didn't have to. He did a good thing in finding them a spot. But yet he went and joined with them. Abuna Meshoi Kamel had a couple of amazing stories as well, and some of our parents got to live with him because he was the first priest here in Los Angeles. There's the orange peel story. You may have heard this one. You know, he would walk down a certain street every day, and there was a Muslim person, a young person, that would eat his orange and just drop it and spit on him every day. And he would say things to him, and when he would just walk on by. Every single day he would do this. Well, one day the guy didn't do it. And then Shoy went and asked the Boeb, the, the doorman, well, what happened? Like, where is this? Oh, you know, like he broke his leg and he's hurt, whatever. So, what would you do? So he went up to see him and he took a bag of oranges with him <laughs> because he missed that blessing. But he went and asked him if he was okay. He says, I know you may not have your oranges. Here are your oranges. That was kind of like the extra mile. There's another story, you know, back at that time in church and sporting. Uh, that was a pretty popular church. I mean, so many things amazing were happening there. And there was a time of a lot of fanaticism and, and bad things were happening. And so sometimes they would kidnap ladies. So one time they actually kidnapped a lady from the church while they were outside, and they told Abuna. So Abuna ran, and he saw the car getting away, and he went and he threw himself on the back of the car, and he held it, and it was dragging him to the point where they said, we have to stop, and they let her go. He could have said, okay, well, let's just wait, let's pray, let's call the police. He threw himself, and he risked himself for this. Father Loa at St. Abraham Church in Torrance um, told us the story. They were priests and, you know, they were walking one time and they got jumped by a group of people and they were beaten up. They were really beaten up. So then, uh, you know, they both got to go home or whatever. And then the next day, Father Loka, he goes to the police officer to go and say, you know, what happened or whatever. And he's telling the story and the leader of the police department is like, 
Is that a bit of a short camel? He's a good guy, isn't he? Munalo is like, yeah, he's the best. It's like, yeah, you know, he was here earlier. He's like, oh, he was. He's like, oh, yeah, he told me everything that happened. He says, oh, he's like, those were our kids. And they were just playing with us, and, and, and nothing really happened. Munalo uh, was a little bit humiliated <laughs> that he came to persecute them. And he says, yeah, he's a really good man. He went the extra mile to those who had beaten him. I heard this story on the news a couple of years ago, and it really moved me. There was this lady who had one son, she was a widow, one son, and her son was shot by this guy, killed, dead. So what she did was she went and told that person when she saw them, I lost my son, and I need another one. I need that to be you. So I want you to come and live in the apartment next to me. I want you to come say hi to me every day. And I'm going to cook for you, and you are going to be my son. That's pretty incredible. And that is the love of Christ's commandment going above and beyond. You know, when I looked up the second mile on Google, you know, I put the second mile Christian so that it would be Christian websites and Christian sites. I got over 3 million hits, you know, like 3 million, 180,000 websites about the Christian second mile. So many churches are called the second mile church. So many ministries are called the second mile ministry that people want to go above and beyond. They want to not do what is required, but they want to go not the obedience, but they want to show love in a special way. You don't know how many times the second mile, not only does it change you, but it changes the other person. Now, I'll be honest, the second mile is exhausting. To go the extra mile is exhausting. And that's okay. The second mile might be towards someone that you don't want to give to. If you think about it, it's crazy to go and visit people in prison. I mean, I bet most of us would want a murderer to be in prison. We want a thief to be there, a rapist. That, like, we don't want them near us. We want them to be put away. And yet there are some people that go, of all people, that go and visit them. Something really struck me last week. I had two friends that moved to India. Some of you know them. They moved to a village, or like a small city in India in the slums that is predominantly Muslim. So they moved to a Muslim slum in India. And their life is now dedicated to serving the Muslims in the Muslim slum in India. I began to think, you know, when I see you know, a Muslim person, you know, and the streets, whatever, that, you know, the lady that's wearing that, you know, like, I have this, like, almost like a negative reaction. And I, I have to confess, that's like something that, I don't know if any of us have been inclined to that, you know, you go to, like, apparently in Orange County, there's a lot of population there. Sometimes you walk around, like, why are there so many here? And it wasn't until this that I realized, I've got something in my heart that is preventing, like, I would almost more willingly give money to an atheist. I thought, how terrible I am. Like, see, when we give money, are you willing to give money to someone that you don't want to? Now, I'm not saying that we're supporting ISIS, but if there were needy Muslim children, would you give to them just like you would give to someone else? I don't know, but maybe that's kind of the second mile. Giving to someone that you may not want to. It's exhausting. You might give to those you don't want to. You give till it hurts. And it satisfies the needs of others, not your own. When you give to a homeless guy, you ever, ever see a family on the corner? What is the normal thing to do? 
to drive them by. Or the normal thing is to like give them a dollar, maybe two. When was the last time you gave the person money and they took it, and then when they got back across the street, they came to your car, they ran, and they looked at it and they were like, whoa. When was the last time you saw the homeless person and said, you know, I would love for you to just get one good night in the hotel and just shower and, I mean, I think that would be kind of like the second lamp. And I think a lot of us could do it. We could afford it, probably wouldn't even, our bank accounts wouldn't even show it. And it would show it, but it wouldn't notice it. The second mile satisfies the needs of others, not your own. When was the last time you really tried to satisfy someone else's need? You know, this second mile thing has really motivated a lot of people. Abunim Shoy Camel wrote that book, and, and it's, a, it's an amazing book, and I, and I highly recommend people considering it. But the second mile is really hard. It is very hard. Many of us could start by doing this with people that we love, like at home. You know, like when you're tired and the spouse is tired and you say, whose turn is it? You say, it's my turn. It's always my turn. That I'm gonna stay up a little bit later and I'll clean. Or I'll wake up a little bit earlier and I'll make breakfast. Or I'll do something, you know, I know you've had a tough day. I'm gonna go and I'll take the kids. Like, if we can't do that with the people we love, how will we ever get to the point of greeting those? Christ says, I mean, even tax collectors who are like heathen at that time, even they say hi to the people they love. They take care of their own. We're almost as good as the tax collectors when we do that. Christ didn't say that. I think we should start in our house, but then we even have to start thinking of going outside. And I just want to say one thing before we do that. The second mile is so difficult. And you can only imagine, but the reason why I'm motivated to do the second mile is because someone did the second mile for me. Christ did something that was very exhausting. He gave it to people who definitely didn't deserve it. He gave to completely satisfy my needs. You see, I didn't deserve the second mile, and neither did you. And he went beyond the second mile, and you received it with joy. Why can we not do even the smallest extent? This is what changes your heart. Because when you start doing things for people that you may not want to, all of a sudden, your heart gets bigger and bigger, and you find that you will begin to embrace everybody, that you will serve everyone. So, I kind of looked into that passage of Ephesians 4 that St. Paul said, you know, let your words be seasoned with salt and stop lying and all these things. And so I kind of came up with a quick practice. Speaking, greeting, giving, and forgiving. Maybe we can start with those. Speaking and greeting, giving and forgiving. We can maybe do the extra mile in these. Speaking. How often are your words used to edify? I mean, it's one thing to say the usual hello, but when was the last time you went out of your comfort zone and you said something to someone that just made their day? Where you notice someone is like working really hard at something and you say, you know what, I just wanted to show you that I really appreciate you. You know, I could never do what you're doing and you know, like, you're special. People might say, why do you always say good things to people? Because I'm starting to care about them. What if your speech was seasoned with salt? What does that sound like? Salt is a good thing. Speech, speaking, and then greeting. Speaking and greeting. I want you to say hi to people that you normally don't say hi to. I mean, there's a lot of grumpy people 
in this world, maybe in your house, maybe in your work. But what if you just started to greet people? I mean, just anyone. You never know when you change someone's day, when you just say hello with a smile. I want us to make an effort this week to speak and to greet, to give in an extra way. If you have the opportunity to give to someone, whether it be a widow or an orphan or a homeless person or someone else in need, I want you to go above and beyond. Give them more than they would expect you to give. And the last one, give and forgive. What if this week, well, we begin this week, we don't stop this week, not like, okay, Sunday, I'm done, I'm done. What if we begin to forgive in the hardest of situations, which most of the time is usually at home or at work? What if you forgave at a time when you least feel like forgiving? You say, you know what, I'm gonna bear this one. It's kind of like how Christ bore the second mile for us. You know, on Thursday night of Holy Week, I spoke about the washing of the feet. And I said, I would love for our church to become the people of the towel. Hopefully you'll listen to that before small groups in, in a couple of weeks. I would like for us to become the people of the towel. I would also like for us to become a second mile church. Not just a church, but second mile individuals. We will be like Christ if everyone saw that we did not the bare minimum, we went above and beyond, they'll notice. And they'll say, why is it that you went one extra mile? You have to say it was voluntarily, out of love for you, and because someone went more than a second mile for me. May God be glorified in your first and your second miles, and your third now and forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray.